There's one fact about stingrays that has always blown my mind. They have no bones. I mean, like at all. Whereas typical fish have bones, stingrays have cartilage instead. That is, the same stuff that humans' nasal septum and ears are made of. By the way, sharks don't have bones too. Together with stingrays, they belong to the subclass of elasmobranch cartilaginous fish. One could even say that stingrays and sharks are sort of like cousins. The absence of bones makes these creatures very flexible. But here's the question. If sharks and stingrays don't have bones, where do their fossilized remains come from? The thing is, as they age, most of these fish deposit calcium salts in their skeletal cartilage to strengthen it. The shark's dried jaws feel heavy and hard, all thanks to these substances. The fossilized shark teeth, the most frequent finds among archaeologists, have enamel, which is why they're preserved for a very long time. But the most interesting thing is that scientists have always considered sharks and stingrays to be more primitive animals because of their cartilage. Well, it seems like more advanced creatures have developed normal bone skeletons, moved to land, grown fur, while these ones are still swimming in the oceans. However, the scientists were in for a surprise when they discovered a 380 million year old fossil shark with bone cells in its cartilaginous skeleton, or rather their remnants, they indicate that sharks most likely evolved from ancestors that used to have many more bones in their skeletons. That is, sharks, and consequently stingrays, didn't remain primitive, they deliberately evolved in a way to abandon bones in favor of cartilage. That means they needed cartilage for some reason. Cartilage is softer than bone and can bend, but it's too elastic to support a relatively large weight. Water changes everything. In the oceans, cartilaginous skeletons aren't a burden for the biggest sharks and stingrays, it's actually a perk. Since cartilage is lighter than bones, cartilaginous fish don't need to put up much effort to swim. This is very important because they drown if they stop swimming. Unlike bony fish, these have no swim bladder. If sharks and stingrays had heavier skeletons, they'd have to use a lot of energy just to move. Cartilage helps save it. And of course, cartilage improves agility, which makes it easier to hunt and avoid those who hunt you. If you've been watching our videos, you know that sharks also fall prey to other predators. Well, if you're new to the channel, you know where to find the subscribe button. In fact, humans and stingrays have something in common. Most of the human skeleton is made up of cartilage at birth. But as we age, the cartilage is gradually replaced by bones. Because as I said, it's impossible to support a lot of weight on a cartilage frame. If human skeletons were made of cartilage, we'd collapse under the weight of gravity. Cartilage might not be as strong and rigid as bone, but this doesn't mean it's very soft. After all, both sharks and stingrays can eat solid food without breaking their jaws. I mean, well, I have to admit, the cartilage is only slightly stronger than jelly with too much gelatin in it. But all cartilaginous fish are built from a stiffer, mineralized version called calcified cartilage. Remember the calcium salts I mentioned at the beginning of the video? The skeleton of cartilaginous fish has multiple layers. Yes, it's still made of cartilage, but of different types. It's like normal bones that get thicker to support increasingly heavier loads, which is why stingrays have fairly strong jaws which can crack mollusk shells. As if they had a nutcracker in their mouth. The ability to do something like that goes against the myths about cartilage being super soft. Nature knows what it's doing. In the meantime, we can use its achievements to unravel other mysteries. For example, scientists have created a stingray robot that moves with the help of cardiac cells taken from a rat. That's because the musculature of the stingray has to do the same thing the heart does – move fluids. The robot's tiny, just 0.6 inches long and contains a gold skeleton plus a single layer of 200,000 cardiac cells wrapped in a gel-like material. The DNA in the cardiac cells was modified to be responsive to light. And that's it. The stingray began to move. With its help, scientists plan to get a better understanding of how the human heart works. Though this isn't the first time stingrays are used for medical purposes, the fact that stingrays generate discharges was known to the ancient Greeks because well, the ancient Greeks were actually very inquisitive. Back then, dentists used stingray venom as an anesthetic. Naturally, ancient Romans also knew what stingrays are capable of. According to some sources, Romans were the first ones to use the electric discharge generated by the stingray for medical purposes. 
The idea supposedly belonged to a court physician, Scribonius Largus. He urged his patients suffering from gout and frequent migraines to stand barefoot right on the backs of live electric eels. As you realize, the stingrays weren't enthusiastic about such an experience, and they shocked the patients as hard as they could. Later, they came up with other treatment using stingrays. Doctors recommended their patients to use live electric stingrays to relieve headaches, toothaches, and rheumatic pains. Fried and boiled stingrays were also used in medicine. They were supposed to cure a bunch of other diseases. Did it really work? I doubt that. In any case, at the dawn of the Middle Ages in Europe, they officially stopped using stingrays for treatment. But let's get back to where we started, namely to bones. Usually, no one doubts they're resilient, but sometimes this resilience may manifest, let's say, in an odd way. This is a wombat. Wombats love digging holes and then live in them. And sometimes, one wombat can use up to 10 different burrows within its home range. Imagine you have 10 houses on one street, and you live in each of them for a while. Sounds weird? Wombats don't mind. When they spot a predator, they prefer to hide in a hole rather than defend themselves. The thing is, wombats are quite chubby, weighing up to 80 pounds, which means they need large burrows. Do you know what prevents a predator from chasing a wombat underground? Wombat butt. Four fused bone plates plus cartilage, fat, thick skin, and more fur on top. The predator can scratch and bite the wombat from behind many times, but the wombat won't get any harm. That's why wombats jump into burrows, plugging the passage with their butts, and feel completely safe. And if the attacker is too persistent, they can always use their butts as a weapon. Slam them against the wall of the hole, crushing the head of the predator. Yes, just like an egg. Researchers have repeatedly stumbled upon foxes killed in this way. And if you're wondering whether there's anything in the animal kingdom as strong as a wombat's butt, check out the spine of shrews. I'm serious. Thor's hero shrew, like its relative, the hero shrew, has a very specific skeletal structure. Its vertebrae have thousands of tiny finger-like projections that allow them to lock into each other, granting remarkable flexibility and the ability to withstand enormous forces. According to scientists, this animal, that's about 6 inches long and weighing less than 0.2 pounds, can carry up to 160 pounds on its back. Probably not far away, but these shrews can withstand the weight of an adult human. And most importantly, no one knows yet why these two species have such a superpower. They just do. And that's it. It's just like alpacas have fire-resistant wool. Just in case, a disclaimer, fire-resistant doesn't mean fireproof. Also, I mean 100% wool. So if you have clothes made from alpaca wool, please don't set them on fire to check if it burns. Deal? Let's continue then. So alpaca wool ignites slowly, the fire spreads slowly, and burning immediately stops when the flame is removed. That is, the wool won't smolder. And apparently the reason is sulfur. It's the sulfur content in wool that reduces the rate of heat release, and consequently the intensity of the fire. It also increases char yielding, which slows down the fire. Though burnt alpaca wool smells like, well, like burnt wool. That is nasty. I gotta say that things made from natural materials generally burn more slowly than synthetic ones, and alpaca wool is simply yet another proof of that. Though it's no match for the material called starlight, it was invented by a British hairdresser and amateur chemist, Maurice Ward, back in the 70s or 80s. Ward claimed that starlight could withstand exposure to a laser beam that can reach temperatures of up to 18,000 degrees Fahrenheit. A plasma cutter capable of cutting a 16-inch thick steel sheet had little effect on the starlight. When exposed to heat, the material chars, forming a highly heat-resistant foam that can protect well, from almost everything. Starlight could withstand temperatures greater than on the sun's surface. Can you imagine the potential this product has? Naturally, everyone, including NASA, became interested in the development. There were experiments and assessments. Ward zealously guarded the secrets of his material, rightly believing that it was worth billions. And then the irreparable thing happened. In 2011, Ward died without revealing the composition of the material. According to the BBC, he took the secret of starlight to his grave. 
true, in 2020, BBC also reported that the Thermoshield company had acquired all of Ward's records, equipment, and other related materials, and was working on creating a viable commercial product. So let's wait and see. In the meantime, we can look at waterproof sheep. If you wet a dog, cat, or any other fairly furry animal, they'll immediately shrink. Wet wool will stick to their bodies, and the poor creatures will look very pathetic. It had seemed the same thing is supposed to happen to sheep. After all, even woolen clothes shrink during washing, but the sheep is where things don't go according to plan. The first reason is the scales on the fibers of wool. When they're made into threads and fabric, the scales end up pointing in different directions. When washed, they interlock, compress the fibers, and the clothes shrink. In the natural state, all the scales point in the same direction, so a wet sheep looks very different from a wet sweater. Second, sheep produce a natural oily substance called lanolin. Lanolin covers the wool and repels water, making sheep rainproof. And this, in fact, is very important. If this much wool got wet, all the sheep would constantly catch colds, and they would have gone extinct long ago. Porcupines could too if they didn't have a life jacket given by evolution. What, you didn't notice it? I'm talking about quills. The porcupine has about 30,000 quills, and the discarded quills are quickly replaced with new ones so the animal is never left defenseless, and it can always swim. You don't usually think about it, but the quills do help porcupines float. They're hard at the base and at the end to protect the porcupine, but hollow in the middle, so porcupines float very well. At the same time, not all of them are exactly fond of swimming, though it depends on each particular animal. By the way, fishermen also appreciate this property of quills. Sometimes they make floats out of them. Of course, when the porcupine no longer needs these quills. See you later.